the beginnings of Adventism and the importance and relevance of them. So if you're not familiar with Adventism, this is a great deal of Advent history that probably isn't going to connect with you as well as it should, but I trust that this is all true and that the Holy Spirit can use this to convict even a non-Adventist. Um, and if you're a non-Adventist wondering why I'm emphasizing Adventism, I would say that the correct Adventist understanding is that the majority of God's people at the end of the world are outside the Adventist church, so we're not being exclusive in this presentation. <coughs> but we are going to deal with Adventist history as we get started. The, the title of our notes here, the title of the presentation here this evening is called The Foundations. And uh, from Councils to Register and Editors, page 28, it says, Let the truths that are the foundation of our faith be kept before the people. We are now to understand what the pillars of our faith are, the truths that have made us as a people what we are, leading us step by step. I don't think by and large that we understand in Adventism today that the foundations and the pillars are two different things. I hope to show you that the difference between the foundations and the pillars, they're directly connected. If, you're, if you've ever been involved with having a house built for yourself or building a house, you know that before you put the pillars, um, before you frame the house up, you have to put down a foundation. They're directly connected to one another, but they are distinctly different. And we're going to try to deal with that tonight, but the first quote is reminding us that as Seventh-day Adventists, we're to be on a regular basis dealing with the foundations of our faith. Perhaps by the end of the evening, if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you will realize, perhaps, that you didn't even know what the foundations of Adventism were. But the reason for this is that Bible prophecy has identified that after the foundation, foundations of Adventism were established over the, the history of Adventism, the understanding of what the foundations were were to be covered up. They were gonna, they're gonna have to be rediscovered at the end of the world by the remnant people of God. That's part of the prophetic testimony. So what I'm saying, you may discover tonight that you don't know what the foundations are. I'm not, I'm not belittling anyone. This is just a fact of prophecy. In early writings, page 259, Sister White, dealing with the subject of the foundation, informs us that when it comes time to understand what the foundations are at the end of the world, there's going to be a controversy in Adventism over those foundations. And from early writings, page 259, she says, I saw a company who stood well-guarded and firm, giving no countenance to those who had unsettled the established faith of the body. Um, if you listen closely to my presentation, you re will realize that my English is very poor. <laughs> very poor at grammar. Many times I'll have brothers and sisters come, you don't know, tell me, you need to really work on your grammar, and they're correct. Sister White says, we're going to be doing public speaking, we should try to improve our grammar. So I'm not setting myself up as an English expert, but what I do remember from my English, and I know that it's sound, is that the first sentence in the paragraph is where the primary subject is set forth if the paragraph is written correctly. And what she's saying here is she's going to tell us something about the established faith of the body. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing I hope you see in that first sentence. I saw a company who stood well guarded and firm, giving no comments to those who had unsettled the established faith of the body. God looked upon them with approbation. I was shown three steps, the first, second, and third angel's messages. Said my accompanying angel, woe to him who shall move a flock or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of a vital importance. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. I was again brought down through these messages and saw how dearly the people of God had purchased their experience that had been obtained through much suffering and severe conflict. God had led them along step by step until he had placed them upon a solid, immovable platform. If this was a class and you were a student and you were working to get a grade, I would tell you at this point, underline the word platform because you're going to find that Sister White talks about the platform and the foundation. They're interchangeable terms and you'll want to know this as you start to try to identify what the foundation and platform are. So he placed them upon a solid and movable platform. 
I saw individuals approach the platform and examine the foundation. Some with rejoicing immediately stepped upon it, others commenced to find fault with the foundation. They wished improvements made, and then the platform would be more perfect and the people much happier. Now notice what happens. Some stepped off the platform to examine it and declared it to be laid wrong. Whatever the foundation and platform is, there comes a point in Advent history where some are going to step off that platform and foundation and they're going to, de they're going to declare, this isn't right. But I saw that nearly all stood firm upon the platform and exhorted those who had stepped step off to cease their complaints, for God was the master builder and they were fighting against him. They recounted the wonderful work of God which had led them to the firm platform and in union raised their eyes to heaven and with a loud voice glorified God. This affected some of those who had complained, unfortunately not all. This affected some of those who had complained and left the platform and they with humble look again stepped upon it. So what I'm suggesting here is that Sister White is talking about the, what she called the established faith of the body of Adventism. And she's saying that the established faith of the body came into Adventism at the time that the first, second, and third angel's messages arrived. She said she was shown three steps, the first, second, and third angel's message. And as she defines, begins to set forth what the established faith of the body is, she calls it the platform and the foundation. And then she gives us a prophecy where she sees some people stepping off the foundation and beginning to criticize it and saying this isn't laid correctly. And she's setting forth a prophecy for Adventism. And this prophecy is dealt with in the scriptures as well. In Jeremiah 6, 16 and 17, which you have in your notes, it says, Thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Now, when, when it says, ye shall find, find rest for your souls, as we go through this study, we're going to show you that the rest they find, that this word rest is a word that means latter rain. Those people that return and walk in the old path are the people that re receive the latter rain. Now, I'm not going to defend that right now. I'm just forewarning you that this is the significance in this verse. The, Thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So notice, when there's a return to the old path, there's a group that says, we're not going to walk in the old path. So there's two groups here. One that's returning to the old path, and the other group says, we're not walking in the old path. A shaking is caused when God's people return to the old path. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Now, generally, as Adventists, we understand that a trumpet in Bible prophecy represents a warning message, and it does. But what I want to say here, we're not going to deal with this, but I want to put it in your, your memory bank for a future reference. The message of the trumpet, the sixth trumpet, is what brought the mighty angel of Revelation 10 down on August 11, 1840. It was a prophecy from the sixth trumpet. It was a trumpet message that confirmed the year-day principle and empowered the Millerite movement in 1840. And we're suggesting that it's the message of the seventh trumpet that marks the beginning of the latter rain here at the end of the world. And when you understand that those people that walk in the old past, that they receive the rest, when you understand that the rest is the latter rain, and then you understand that the latter rain begins to fall when the seventh trumpet begins, then you'll see that the context of 16 and 17 of Jeremiah 6 here is talking about a shaking that goes on when it's time for the latter rain to fall, because when they return to the old past, there's a group that says, we won't walk in the old past. And the watchman that says, listen to the sound of the trumpet, there's a group that says, we will not listen to the sound of the trumpet. There's a controversy connected with the old past. Now the next quote, I hope you see in the next quote, that what Sister White's going to do here, is she's going to tie the old past of Jeremiah into the foundations of Adventism. Okay? This is more than one paragraph. You have the first paragraph on the first page here, but we're going to flip right over she says, the enemy is seeking to divert the minds of our brethren and sisters from the work of preparing a people to stand in the last days. So this is a serious commentary here. She's talking about Satan attempting to prevent Seventh-day Adventists from 
achieving the preparation that they need to be among the 144,000. Okay? Serious commentary here. The enemy is seeking to divert the minds of our brethren and sisters from the work of preparing a people to stand in these last days. His sophistries are designed to lead minds away from the perils and duties of the hour. They estimate of little value the light that God Christ came from heaven to give to John for his people. What you talking about there? They estimate of little value the book of Revelation. Okay? They're, don't, they're not interested in studying the prophetic word. But that's, we're not dealing with that here. But next sentence. They teach that the scenes just before us are not of sufficient importance to receive special attention. They make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin. Now notice what she says. And rob the people of God of their past experience, giving them instead of false signs. Thus saith the Lord, standing in the ways and see and ask for the old past, where is the good way, walk therein. Now notice what she says immediately after she quotes Jeremiah 6, 16. Let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith. The foundations of that were laid in the 1950s. Is that what she says? The foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work. By careful study of the word and by revelation, upon these foundations we have been building for more than 50 years. Men may suppose that they found a new way, that they can lay a stronger foundation than that which has been laid, but this is a great deception. Other foundation can no man lay than it is laid. In the past, many have undertaken to build a new faith to establish new principles, but how long did their building stand? It soon fell, for it was not founded upon the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. Here she's taking Paul, who says, Other foundation can no man lay than which has been laid. And then what does Paul say? She doesn't quote the last part of the verse. What does Paul say? Which is Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the foundation, right? But there she says, the, the, the group that is not building upon the foundation is building upon sand, but they're not building upon the rock, and we know that the rock is Christ. So she's, she's agreeing with Paul that Christ is the foundation. All right? Next paragraph. Did not the first disciples have to meet the sayings of men? Did they not have to listen to false theories? And then having an all to stand firm, saying other foundation can no man lay it, then that is laid. So we are to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now notice this next quote. Review and Herald, April 14, 93. That was Testimonies, Volume 8, page 296, 297. But for Review and Herald, April 14, 1903, this will help us tie some thoughts together, hopefully. The warning has come. Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we have built been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. The foundation, according to Sister White, is the message that came in 1842, 1843, 1844. And the foundation, according to Sister White, is the platform. And the foundation of the platform there's going to be men that step off it as time progresses and declare it's laid wrong. We need to lay it a different way. And that's just Sister White expressing what Jeremiah was saying, that when it comes time to return to the old past, there's going to be a group that says, we will not walk there. But as Sister White in the previous quote, not this quote, the previous quote, as she was talking about that foundation, she said the foundation was the rock, and we agree, I think, that the rock is Christ. All right? But here, she's saying the foundation are the messages that came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. Let me finish this. The warning has come, nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 43, and 44. I was in this message, and ever since I've been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us. We do not propose to take our feet off the what? The platform on which they were placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer seeking for light. Do you think that I could give up the light that God has given me? It is to be as well. The rock of ages. She's being 
specific that the foundation and the platform or the truths that came in 1842, 1843, and 1844, but at the same time she's saying those truths, those messages are Christ. And that's why she said in an earlier quote that when the men were fighting against these foundational truths, they're fighting against God. Now it may be a little bit difficult as we move through this tonight because what I'm going to suggest to you I hope, hopefully, what I'm going to demonstrate conclusively to you is that those truths that are the foundations are the truths that are represented on this chart. This is the 1843 Pioneer chart. This is, these truths are the foundation. If you come to understand that, then you'll have the, the mental challenge to explain to yourself how those truths can be Christ, how they can be the Rock of Ages, but they are, they are. But that's what she's saying, okay? It is to be as the rock of age, is, it has been guiding me ever since it was given. Manuscript releases, volume 4, page 246. I am instructed to say to those who endeavor to tear down the foundation that has made us Seventh-day Adventists, we are God's commandment-keeping people. For the past 50 years, Every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to becloud our minds regarding the teaching of the Word, especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the message of heaven for these last days as given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of truth which, point by point, has been sought out by prayerful study, prayerful study and testified to by the miracle-working power of the Lord. But the waymarks which have made us what we are, are to be carefully preserved, and they will be preserved, as God has signified through His Word and the testimony of His Spirit. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the group of faith to the fundamental <coughs> principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. And she says, she mentions the waymarks, and you'll see a definition from the Webster's Dictionary of her day and age of what a waymark is. It's a a mark to guide in traveling. A way mark is a mark along the way. And when she's talking about the way marks that have made us a special people, she's talking about the, the prophecies that brought together the Millerites at the very beginning in order to introduce modern Israel on October 22nd, 1844, to introduce Adventism. Um, Jeremiah 31, 21 says, Set thee up way marks. Make thee high heaps, set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest, turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to these cities. How many know who Joseph Bates is? Joseph Bates was, most people will say, he's one of the three primary founders of Adventism. And um, in the beginning, he was doing a lot of writing, and one of his, I don't know if it's his best, one of his articles that I like more than most of his articles is called Waymarks and High Heaps. It's longer than that, but that's the, the basic title of that article. And he takes it from this verse, Waymarks and High Heaps. And it's that title, what he does is he goes through the Millerite history and he explains all the fulfillments of prophecy that took place in that history because that's what they understood the Waymarks to be. 1798, the papacy receives a deadly wound. That's a Waymark. It's a prophetic fulfillment. 1840, August 11th, 1840. The Ottoman Empire comes to an end in fulfillment of Revelation 9, verses 14 and 15. That was a waymark. When that took place, the year-day principle of Bible prophecy was confirmed before the whole world, and the mighty angel of Revelation came down out of heaven, and he had the little book of Daniel open in his hand on August 11th, 1840. In 1842, in May of 1842, Habakkuk 2 was fulfilled. Anyone? Some of you know, and you can't answer this question. This is for those of us that don't know the answer. Any of you know how Habakkuk 2 was fulfilled in May of 1842? Right here. This chart. This chart is the fulfillment of prophecy. By the way, this chart is the fulfillment of prophecy too. This is the 1843 pioneer chart. <coughs> This is the 1850 Pioneer chart. And Sister White says both of these charts were ordered by God. And they are both a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2. 
And the 1843 chart on the, on the right there, it's called the 1843 chart because it was predicting the end of the world in 1843, but it was published in May of 1842. And it, when it was published, it was a fulfillment of Habakkuk chapter 2. 1843, the 1335 time prophecy of Daniel 12 was fulfilled. 1844, Daniel 14 was fulfilled. The 2520 was fulfilled. How many are familiar with the 2520 time prophecy? Okay, it's right up there on the right-hand corner of the chart on the right, and it's down here on the upper right-hand corner on the chart on the right, the lower right-hand corner on the chart on the left. We'll deal with that more as we proceed. Waymarks are prophetic fulfillments. Those prophetic fulfillments have identified who we are as a people, and in so doing, they illustrate what takes place at the end of the world because that history is repeated at the end of the world. We'll do more of that as the week progresses, Lord willing. On page three, another quote. Top of page manuscript releases, volume 15, page 371. Brothers and sisters, what we're going to attempt to do tonight, one of the things we're going to attempt to do is show you that the truths represented on these charts are the foundation and the pillars. We're going to, we're going to be specific about the, the difference between the foundations and the pillars. But we're going to show you that it's those truths that become the controversy in Adventism at the end of the world during the time period of the latter rain. And we have to return to those old paths and walk therein if we're going to receive the latter rain. But what I want to point out to you is this. The controversy of these truths cannot be separated from the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is part of this test. And you, so if you may be sitting there, I get a lot of criticism sometimes like this. You say, this guy, all, all he did was read a bunch of spirit prophecy quotes. He doesn't read any Bible. Okay, if you come all throughout the week, you're going to find some of the presentations we're going to read more Bible than we are the spirit of prophecy. But tonight we're dealing with these foundational truths, and I hope you'll see by, by at least tomorrow night that when it comes to the test of these foundational truths, you cannot separate the spirit of prophecy from that test. You'll see what I mean. You, it's... It's simultaneously a test over those foundational truths and the spirit of prophecy. It always has been. From the very beginning in Advent history, and there's much Advent history that's recorded over the controversies of the truths represented on the, those charts. All the controversies that have taken place over those truths through the 150 years of Adventism bring in Ellen White into the argument. What did she say about it? What did she mean about it? So you, even in the history of Adventism, you cannot separate the spirit of prophecy from the argument over the foundations. Now, I know there's a, I've been told some of us in here aren't Seventh-day Adventists, so it limits, and of course I don't know who you are yet. It doesn't matter if I know who you are or not. It doesn't matter if you're not an Adventist, I'm not concerned about it. But I like to ask the question sometimes for Adventists, but I might be out of place for asking you if you're a non-Seventh-day Adventist. I don't mean to make you uncomfortable, but how many of you in here as Seventh-day Adventists have confidence in the writings of Ellen White? But don't, 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 don't raise your hand. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't want to put a Seventh-day Adventist on the spot. You know, it's, they, you know, you really don't have that confidence in it, but you're sitting around a bunch of Adventists and you're unafraid to not raise your hand. I don't want to make you bear false witness. But brothers and sisters, in terms of these studies, we're, we're approaching these studies from the point of view that the inspiration that directed the writings of Ellen White is the identical inspiration that directed the writings of the Bible. Okay, that's how we're approaching it, so we'll be out front here. And many in Adventism don't have even close to that concept about the spirit of prophecy. But, in the Great Controversy, Speaking of this chart right here, this is what she says. We're on page 3 under 1842. As early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it had suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and the Revelation. Notice what she says. This is inspired. The publication of this chart was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. 
Now, for Seventh-day Adventists, if, if you tell the Seventh-day Adventists that in 1798, General Berthier came into the city of Rome and he took the Pope captive and, and took him out of the city of Rome and that was the deadly wound, they'll say, yes, I understand. That was a historical event that fulfilled the prophecy. I get it. But sometimes, Seventh-day Adventists don't seem to understand that the production of this chart was as much a fulfillment of prophecy as Berthier taking the Pope captive. And that's what Sister White says here. The publication of this chart was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. No one, however, then noticed that the apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision, a tarrying time, is presented in the same prophecy. After the disappointment, what disappointment is she talking about? Now, what I, one of the things that's worth putting into the record here, these truths were the foundations of Adventism, but the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy teaches that as the history of Adventism progresses, these truths begin to get covered up, where, where at the end of the world, God's people no longer are familiar with these truths. That's why Jeremiah says that we have to return to the old paths. There has to be, in Isaiah 58, 12, speaking of the 144,000, says they're going to restore the past to dwell in. There's a work of restoration of the past to dwell in, and the past to dwell in are the old paths of Jeremiah 6, 16. So I want to try to illustrate something to you. When she's talking about the disappointment here, in connection with this chart, <coughs> which disappointment is she speaking about? Spring disappointment. If you know these questions, don't answer. <laughs> it, that wasn't the right answer that I was looking for anyway, even if it was right. Which disappointment is she speaking about? The first disappointment. Do you, you realize there was two disappointments in this history, right? Okay, what was the first disappointment? Pardon me? That's, that's the answer I'm looking for. The brother here says 1843. How many believe the first disappointment was the disappointment of 1843? Yes and no. When did the disappointment arrive? March. March 22nd, 1844. See, the only reason I'm doing this is because some of us, those of us in Adventism that know the first disappointment was the disappointment of the year 1843. We may know that, but we don't realize that, the, that they were operating on the biblical reckoning of time and they understood that the year began on March 21st and it ended on March 21st. So the disappointment of 1843 didn't actually set in until March 22nd, 1844, which they believed was the first day of 1844. And all I'm letting us know is that every Millerite knew that. But here at the end of the world, it's, it's vague, okay, it's been covered up. We're unfamiliar with this history and these truths. Typically, not everyone is. <coughs> okay. No one ever then noticed that an apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision at tarrying time is presented in the same prophecy. Um, we might come back to this quote in the Great Controversy, but if you go to the next page, we'll look at Habakkuk. This is the passage in Habakkuk that led them to produce the 1843 chart. It says, I will stand upon my watch. I'm on the top of page 4. Habakkuk 2 verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what shall I shall answer when I'm reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon a table that he may run that readeth it. Is that what it said? What's it say? Upon, upon tables, plural. Okay, now we're going to show you as we proceed that these are the tables, plural. Because Sister White's clear that the 1843 chart was the fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, and she's clear that the 1850 chart was the fulfillment of Habakkuk 2. And Habakkuk 2 says, write the vision and make it plain upon tables, in the plural. Okay, that he may run that readeth. And then in verse 3 it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it. The first two verses convicted them to make this chart, and then when the first disappointment came and they were disappointed, then they realized that verse 3 identified a tarrying time. 
So not only did this, this passage of Habakkuk lead them to produce the chart, it thereafter gave them the courage to go ahead and carry the message even after the disappointment because they realized the prophecy had identified a tarrying time. Okay, now if you go back to the previous page, we'll read on some more great controversy. I'm, I'm still in the first paragraph. After the disappointment, this scripture appeared very significant. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. The just shall live by his faith. A portion of Ezekiel's prophecy also was a sort of source of strength and comfort to believers. And then she quotes Ezekiel 12. <coughs> I won't read all that because of time, but this was also a passage in scripture that led them to produce his char. The third paragraph says, The waiting ones rejoiced, believing that he who knows the end from the beginning had looked down through the ages and foreseeing their disappointment had given them words of courage and hope. Had it not been for such portions of scriptures admonishing them to wait with patience and to hold fast their confidence in God's word, their faith would have failed in that trying hour. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. Now she's going to tie in this chart with the parable of the ten virgins. This chart is connected with Habakkuk 2, but she also ties it in with Matthew 25. Is there a tarrying time in the parable of the ten virgins? Yes. So we're getting two biblical testimonies and Ellen White's comment along with it, which is a third witness, to how that chart is a fulfillment of prophecy. Now this, this is this is an important passage here because when she talks about the parable of the ten virgins, illustrating the experience of the Adventist people. We're not here yet, but this, we, we were going to deal with the fact, and you have it in the handout on prophetic keys, it, there is a portion of these prophetic rules where you can read for yourself and see that the parable of the ten virgins teaches that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world, that the three angels of Revelation 14 teach that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world, and that Daniel 12 teaches that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. Therefore, and you can check it out in, in the prophetic keys, therefore, if this chart was a waymark, if it was a prophetic fulfillment in the Millerite history, when that history is repeated at the end of the world, you should, you should expect, expect to see this chart once again come in to history with a significance that parallels the significance it had in the Millerite movement. Okay? Now on the next page, page four. Let me let me just throw something here. Is everybody doing all right? I mean, this is this got to be harder on you than me. You you are all working all day long. Some of you were flying all night long and then working all day long. I've just been waiting for this one hour here at the end of the day. I'm going to throw something in here. I hope I don't mean to lose you. But the Millerite history was a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. Sister White says it over and over again. The Millerites understood it. The Millerites understood that they were fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins. They knew it. Sister White confirms it. We should know it. And the parable of the ten virgins is a story about going to the marriage, is it not? Okay, and Sister White says on October 22nd, 1844, among other things, I'm not saying only, but on that day, when Christ moved into the holy place, he entered into the way. You, are you familiar with that truth? That that's one of the things that's being taught on October 22nd, 1844. Christ enters into the marriage and the parable of the ten virgins is the history that leads to the way that begins on October 22nd, 1844. If you understand that, say amen. amen. How many of you understand that on October 22nd, 1844, Christ entered into covenant with modern Israel? Amen. Okay. Okay, this, this is where the government took place. Okay, what's the best What's the best type of modern Israel? You know what a type is? A type is something that illustrates the anti-type. The anti-type is the final revelation. A type is what something that prefigures the anti-type. What's the best type of modern Israel in the Bible? Yes. Ancient Israel. Ancient Israel illustrates modern Israel. 
Was there a time when ancient Israel entered into covenant with God? When? Pardon me? At Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai. Okay, they came, they came out of Egypt. The Lord entered into covenant with them. And you know what he did? He married them, did he not? Because at the stoning of Stephen, Israel was divorced of God. So ancient Israel was married at Sinai. Modern Israel was married on October 22nd, 1844. The Lord entered into covenant with ancient Israel here. He entered up into covenant with modern Israel. And what did he give to ancient Israel in that history? He gave them the law, did he not? He gave them the law. But how did he give them the law? Stone. Stone. How many stones? Okay. When he entered into covenant with ancient Israel, he gave them two tables. And when he entered into covenant with modern Israel, he gave them two tables. The 1843 and the 1850 chart. And that's why Habakkuk says, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. Because this history is prefigured by this history. And when you get to the time period of ancient Israel, where they're about to be divorced of God, Christ was walking among them, and Christ was the law. Was he not? His character was a perfect reflection of the law. And Christ was bumping heads with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were those in that history that were the defenders of the law. They were the defenders of the foundation of ancient Israel. And they didn't even know the law when it was walking right in front of them. Therefore, if ancient Israel is the type of modern Israel, when we get to the end of the world, the modern Pharisees, are going to be fighting the two tables, even though they're claiming to be those that defend the tables. They're not even going to know what they are. Anyway, <laughs> what we're dealing with is sacred ground, brothers and sisters. I hope to, to stimulate your, your thoughts along that line. And page four, and from early writings, page 74, it says, I've seen, and that's this chart here, I've seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, altered that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over his mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. The previous page, Sister White says that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Notice what James White says. In all of these words are James White, White's words. There's a part in here that's in in brackets, and I realized recently that someone thought I put those brackets in there because I was putting my own words in. Not so, this is all James White. It says, it was the united testimony of Second Advent lectures and papers where when standing on the original faith that the publication of the chart was a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3. Then he asked the question, if the chart was a subject of prophecy, and those who deny it leave the original faith. Wow. If you deny that this chart is a fulfillment of prophecy, you've just stepped off the foundation and platform because the foundation and platform is the established faith of the body. Early writings, page 259. That's how the pioneers understood that chart. Notice the next quote. This is from Joseph Bates. In May of 1842, a general conference was convened in Boston, Massachusetts. At the opening of this meeting, Brethren Charles Fitch and Apollos Hill of Haverhill presented the pictorial prophecies of Daniel and John, which they had painted on cloth with the prophetic numbers showing their fulfillment. If you want to see one of the originals, you can walk over here to the Del Webb Library and go into the ballroom there, and they have one of these original charts that they're speaking about painting on the wall. You're not, supposed, you're not supposed to cover, but I would cover one of those charts. I would really like to see one of these, too, but I don't know where one of those are. With which they had painted on cloth with the prophetic numbers showing their fulfillment. Brother Fitch, in explaining from his chart before the conference, said, while examining these prophecy, he, he, prophecies, 
He had the thought if he could get out something of the kind as here presented, it would simplify the subject and make it easier for him to present to an audience. Here was more light on our pathway. The brethren had been doing what the Lord had shown Habakkuk in his vision 2468 years before, saying, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readers it. So the vision is yet for an appointed time. It's totally outside of our presentation. But what kind of mindset was going on with those pioneers that they would know that Habakkuk wrote that 2468 years before 1842? What kind of thinking were they into as they were figuring out the prophecies? I don't, I don't think we're at that level quite yet. Anyway, not only did Sister White say this is a way Mark, all the pioneers understood that this was a prophetic fulfillment and the pioneers understood that if you did not believe that, you were rejecting the original faith of Adventism. Now, the same quote we just read, only now I'm going to tie it up. The first thing I was trying to emphasize from earlier writings, page 74, is that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. Same quote, I want to emphasize one other thing. One other thing, it says, I've seen that the 1843 charter was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. But the first time she commented on this was in the compilations of Spalding and McGann. What's in early writings is taken from something that she said after Spalding and McGann. And in Spalding and McGann, you can tell she's saying the same thing, but she says it a little bit different. That's on the next page on the top of the page. She said, I saw that the truth should be made plain upon tables, that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's, and that necessary means should be, not be spared to make it plain. I saw that the old chart, that's this one. In the early writing, she says, I saw that the 1843 chart. Here she says, I saw that the old chart was directed by the Lord, and that a, not a figure of it should be altered except by inspiration. In early writing 74, she says, it should not be altered, and then it, there's a, a comma, and she just moves on. But here it's falling again. She says, it should not be altered except by inspiration. The reason that I'm emphasizing this is it does get altered by inspiration. This chart here, she's given a vision and said, it's time to produce this chart. This is the correction of this chart. This is um, they're the same chart. They're the same chart. Um, so, next thought from early writing 74 that I want you to see. And brothers and sisters, you may not be familiar in it, with it, but because there are men now and women around the world that are dealing with these issues, you may not be aware of that, but there are. I personally know people on, personally know people on every continent in the world today now that are teaching these things about the foundational truths. And because of that, there are people that are either saying, yeah, I can see it, or I don't care, or no, this is dead wrong. And those that are saying that no, this is, are de is dead wrong, they're saying that this chart here, it's riddled with errors, and they say, Sister White even says so. And they use this quote. Now, maybe this chart is riddled with errors, I don't believe that, but I want to show you that you cannot use the writings of Ellen White to make that claim. All right, now, in early writing 74, where it says the mistake in some of the figures is a subtitle there. It says, I've seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord that should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake, singular, in some of the figures, plural. You see the distinction there? She says there's a mistake. You can't use Ellen White writings, you can say there's a bunch of mistakes on that chart, but you can't honestly use Ellen White's writings to say that, because she says there was a mistake singular. And those people that make that claim and use this passage in early writings, they never go on further in early writings, because Sister White in the same book explains what the mistake is. You have it right underneath there, early writings, page 235. I saw the people of God joyful in expectation, looking for their Lord but God designed to prove them. His hand covered a mistake, singular, in the reckoning of the prophetic periods. Those who were looking for their Lord did not discover this mistake, singular, and the most learned men who opposed the time also failed to see it. 
Jesus and all the heavenly hosts look with sympathy and love upon those who had sweet with sweet expectation, expectation long to see him whom their souls love. Angels were hovering around them to sustain them in their hour of trial. Those who had, and she's talking about the first disappointment here, those who had ne neglected to receive the heavenly message were left in darkness and God's anger was kindled against them because they would not receive the light which he had sent them from heaven. Those faithful disappointed ones who could not understand why their Lord did not come were not left in darkness. Again, they were led to their Bibles to search the prophetic periods. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures, plural, and the mistake, singular, was explained. Do you see that? You can't use Ellen White to say there's a bunch of mistakes on that chart. All you can use Ellen White for is to say there is a mistake, singular. She goes on to say, they saw that the prophetic periods reached to 1844. And that the same evidence which they had presented to show the prophetic periods closed in 1843 proved they would terminate in 1844. Now, brothers and sisters, here's the point. Their mistake, to boil it down to in a simple concept, was the year zero. Okay? They, they went from 457, added 2300 years, came to 1843 because they had a mistake in the year zero. All right, but they did that also in one other place. The 2520 time prophecy, right here. They went from 677 BC, added 2520 years, and because of the year zero, they came to 1843. One mistake, the year zero, represented in both these figures, plural. Okay? You can't use Ellen White to say that chart's full of mistakes. You can, but you're being dishonest or you're really uninformed. And in either case, you're fighting against God because the truths on that chart are the rock of ages. <laughs> We've already read that. We, because we're at the end of the world and all these things have been covered up and fulfilling the prophecy, we don't understand the sacred ground we're walking on and we're fighting against these truths, unfortunately. Now, the next, the next thing I want to add to this is, in my mind, very important to see. How, I'm, most of us that are Adventists, for very long anyway, we remember that there was a time when the Millerites came together and they studied together all night long. You remember that? And Sister White was with them. And during that time period, Sister White, she couldn't understand the Bible. She says her mind was locked. She couldn't understand anything of the Bible. And here's all the brethren trying to study for truth. And there was times where they just couldn't reach a conclusion, correct? Do you remember that? And then and only then, Sister White would be taken off into vision and she'd be given some light on what they were studying with, and she'd share it, and they'd put that piece in place, and then they'd move to the next piece, and they hammered out those truths. You all remember that experience? Yes. It's important to note when that phenomenon took place. Absolutely essential to see when that took place. Notice the next quote. I do not wish to ignore or drop one link in the chain of evidence that was formed as after the passing of time in 1844. She's talking about after October 22nd, 1844. That's what, she, in her terminology, the passing of time is October 22nd, 1844. The time for the Lord's return to pass. Okay? I do not wish to ignore or drop one link in the chain of evidence that was formed as, after the passing of time in 1844, little companies of seekers after truth met together to study the Bible and to ask God for light and guidance. The truth, point by point, was fastened in our minds so firmly that we could not doubt. The evidence given in our early experience has the same force that it had then. The truth is the same as it has ever been and not a pin or a pillar can be moved from the structure of truth. Now, notice this sentence. That which was sought for out of the Word in 1844, 1845, and 1846 remains truth in every particular. This phenomenon went from 1844 to 1846. Now, brothers and sisters, from 1844 to 1846, 
They weren't trying to figure these things out. They had to figure it out. What, what they were trying to figure out is what happened on October 22nd, 1844. From 1844 to 1846, this is where the pillars of Adventism are raised up. This is the history where they discovered the three angels' messages, the law of God, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the mark of the beast, the pillars of Adventism are, are identified from 1844 to 1846. And when this work was over, then Sister Wright says, the Bible was open to her understanding. Now my point is this, this is really important to see. In this history, from 1840 to 1844, the platform, the foundations, however you want to express them, the established faith of the body, the foundations are raised from 1840 to 1844, but from 1844 to 1846, the pillars are established. You see the logic there? You may not understand why it's significant, and maybe it isn't significant, maybe I'm just putting the wrong emphasis on it, but we'll see. Next page. We're now I'm going to look at 1850. This is the 1850 Pioneer chart. It was produced by Brother Nichols. If you haven't looked at this chart before, afterwards you can come look. You can see his Nichols up here, his name up here, Brother Nichols. And on the top of page six, she says, Our next conference was in Fairhaven. Brother Bates and wife were present. Pardon me? Okay. Our next city conference was in Fair Haven. Brother Bates and wife were present. It was quite a good meeting. Our return to Brother Nichol, on our return to Brother Nichol, Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be plain, made plain upon tables. Where is Sister White grabbing that phrase from? Habakkuk 2. But, but this is taking place in 1850. Habakkuk 2 has already brought the, the 1843 chart into existence. And now in 1850, the Lord has given her a vision saying, the truth must be made plain upon tables. Okay? And it would cause many to decide for the truth by the three angels' messages and the two former being made plain upon tables. Then in Manuscript Releases, Volume 5, page 201, it says this, The Lord showed me that he, James, her husband, must take the testimonies that the leading Adventists published in 1844 and republish them and make them ashamed. Do you know what she's saying? That in 1844, the majority of the Millerites lost their way. And the Lord gives her a vision saying, you need to go back to these truths in this history, the foundational truths, the truths on the 1843 chart, and you need to start publishing them in order to shame the brethren that have gone off the platform. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand why it's called the Review and Herald. The Review, that name is picked because he was reviewing this history Amen. in order to shame these brethren that got off the platform on October 22nd, 1844. That's why the Review is called the Review. Amen. Even though now we call it. I won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> The Lord showed me that he, James, must take the testimonies that the leading Adventists published in 44 and republish them and make them ashamed. He is now doing that work. You know, he's supposed to take the writings that William Miller had written and reprint William Miller's article to try to win him back to the truth. Continuing on. Go, God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart. I saw it was needed and that the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and would cause souls to come to a knowledge of the truth. On our return to Brother Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision and showed me the truth must be made plain upon tables and it would cause many to decide for the truth by the third angel's message with the two former being made plain upon tables. I saw also that, this, that it was necessary for a paper to be published as for the messengers to go, for the messengers need a paper to carry with them containing 
present truth to put in the hands of those that hear the truth and then the truth would not fade from the mind and that the paper would go where the messengers could not go other things I saw which will appear in the paper I want to go a little bit farther brother Dwayne before we stop the Lord tells her that there needs to be a new chart and so James starts the work and the next quote she's commenting that this chart is underway you need to this isn't familiar ground for Adventists. Many Adventists are familiar when she's talking about the 1843 chart that in early writings it says, I saw that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord. We're, we're somewhat familiar with those comments, but we don't know that, we don't, we never knew there was an 1850 chart. And if we did know a little bit about the 1850 chart, we didn't know that Sister White had any comments on it. So here's one comment on it while it's getting produced. My dear brother and sister Loveland, I hope to send you some papers soon. The chart is being executed in Boston. God is in it. Brother Nichols has the chart, the chart of it. This is the Nichols chart. Amen. Brother Otis Nichols. Oh, Nichols. This is what she's speaking about here. Now, after it's published, here's what she says from Manuscript Releases, Volume 13, page 359. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is designed for God's people, it is, if it is sufficient for one, it is for another. And if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale, I'll need it just as much. I saw that it was a restless, uneasy, unsatisfied, ungrateful feeling in Brother Case that desired another chart. I saw that these painted charts had bad effect upon the congregation. It caused a light, chaffy spirit of ridicule to be in the meeting. Another guy's producing a chart, and she doesn't like that chart. That chart wasn't directed by the hand of the Lord. So she's commenting on it. Now notice what she says. I saw that the charts ordered by God struck the mind favorably. Charts, plural. What charts were ordered by God? The 1843 and the 1850 chart were ordered by God. He, how did he order them? Well, he, he gave Sister White a vision, but how did he order them in the Bible? Habakkuk 2. They were ordered by God. I saw that the charts ordered by God struck the mind favorably, even without an explanation. There is something light, lovely, and heavenly in the representation of the angels on the chart. The mind is almost imperceptibly led to God in heaven, but the other charts that have been gotten up disgust the mind, cause the mind to dwell more on earth than heaven. Images representing angels, representing angels look more like fiends than beings of heaven. I saw that the chart charts had for days and weeks occupied Brother Case's mind when he should have been seeking heavenly wisdom from God and should have been growing in the graces of the Spirit and the knowledge of the truth. Now, I've been told to take a 10-minute break, and so I don't lose any of you, hopefully, during that break. I will tell you, we just have a few minutes left for this first presentation. So, well, I don't know. Let's do it this way. You want to take a break? You want to just finish this first presentation off? Let's take a break. Take a break. Okay, well, let's close with prayer then. Brother, do you want to have a prayer? Yes.